So thank you for coming. Welcome. Um, I'm actually not the person you're going to be you're going to be listening to. I just have a couple announcements to make before I turn it over to David Lamb. Um, first of all, the, the, I have to give you a little legal language. So this uh, event is being live streamed and recorded. So I need to say this presentation is being streamed and recorded and could possibly be published at a later date. So if you don't want to appear in, in this uh, in this video, um, stay away from this podium and that table. <laughs> Otherwise, you you will appear and don't say anything. Yeah, right. Um, also Q and A. Um, we thought sort of hard given the the um, tech logistics in here about the best way to take your questions. And I and and what we decided is that you all should have note cards um, that were on your seats when the when you arrived. We have extras, so you know wave your hand and one of my committee members will, will come and get you an extra. But please write the questions down on those cards whenever they come to you. And again, just kind of like stick them up and we're gonna be watching and we'll come collect them from you and then bring them to uh, to Keisha, our moderator. We will bring them up to her um, towards the end of the presentation and she will answer your questions at that time. Um, we, we love the sort of dialogue between the podium and the audience. The only tricky part is that we have this live stream going on and the microphones on the ceiling aren't gonna be quite good enough to allow folks to hear you. So we're gonna be doing the best we can here. Uh, I think that was it, unless my committee is, is there anything else that I need to do? I don't think so. Okay, uh, so then I'll turn it over to David Lamb. Thank you. Okay. I am David Lamb. I'm director of the Institute for Social Research, as most of you know. Um, it's my honor and uh, great privilege to welcome you all to this I ISR event um, as part of the campus-wide Martin Luther King Jr. Symposium. Um, I looked up on the campus event calendar for the MLK Symposium, and uh, this is the first event that's listed. So we're really kicking off the whole campus-wide uh, event, which is kind of cool. And, um, and I encourage you to go to that uh, calendar because there are many, many, as every year, many, many uh, excellent, uh, really interesting sounding events. Uh, most of them, of course, on uh, Monday, uh, which is Martin Luther King Jr. Day, but, um, but there are more events tomorrow and Friday and, and all of next week, including sort of part two of this event, which is uh, a screening that I'm sure more will be said about. Um, uh, of the movie <coughs> Class Divide uh, next Wednesday from 12 to 2 uh, at the Michigan Theater, which is the um, sort of companion event uh, for the ISR uh, event. These uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day uh, events that the campus has have been a very important part of the university uh, for many, many years. Um, they are always interesting, quite diverse, give us a chance to celebrate Dr. King's life and have an opportunity to reflect on the issues and challenges that he spent his life uh, working on, and uh, I think they're you know they're really always uh, excellent events. Always too many for for anybody to take advantage of all of them, but you know a really interesting uh, menu. They've always been important in ISR, and I think it, particularly in ISR fit extremely well with our mission. So uh, just as today's session, uh, these events that ISR has had. Um, almost always, probably always, uh, certainly this, certainly it's the case this year, uh, fit extremely well with the kind of research that we do uh, in ISR and the kind of topics that we all uh, engage in. So it's, uh, it's great to have this really uh, interesting panel here uh, today. And also, it's worth noting that uh, both within ISR and the university, of course, these uh, MLK events have become uh, even more salient than they usually are because of our ongoing diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, initiative. So they ex fit extremely well uh, into the DEI activities that we um, have going. Um, I, w I actually was going to take opportunity to, uh, uh, to mention uh, as an aside about uh, Michigan time. We were talking about Michigan time. So, uh, and some of you may be arriving a little late because of Michigan time. So. Traditionally, Michigan time at Michigan, as most of you know, uh, classes always started at 10 minutes after the hour and then they end on the hour or on the half hour, depending on whether it's a, a one hour or hour and a half class. Uh, that is officially ending. I was actually at a meeting of all the deans this morning. Um, we are doing away with Michigan time um, because for events like this, uh, one of the many reasons we're doing it is events like this always confusing of just two o'clock being two o'clock or two ten. But at any rate, so starting in the spring semester this summer, 
classes are going to start on the hour, so all events like this will be clear starting the hour and then amazing how hard it was to to make a change like that. everybody's been wanting to do it for decades i think but the provost finally said we're doing it so but some complications about implementing it anyway you're the first to know um so i just wanted to say that by tradition uh in isr the uh five isr centers uh take turns organizing the mlk events and this year icpsr uh uh took the initiative did a great job had a lot of great ideas put together this event and the companion event uh next wednesday they're very exciting um events and i want to thank icpsr as a institution and uh, maggie is director who you'll meet in one second uh, but also to thank the committee, which included uh, Dharma Ackman, Rita Bantam was the chair, Joanna Bleckman, Ashley Ebersole, Doreen Knight Ingram, uh, Anna Massey, our events uh, coordinator, uh, participated, Matthew Morley, Ruth Shamraj, uh, Piper Simmons, and Filippo Stargell. So thanks to that committee, because I know they worked really hard, and, uh, and uh, it's great to see such a great crowd here to take advantage of their, uh, the great event they've organized. I also want to thank uh, Frank Kalin from CMT, who's uh, organizing the the live streaming and the and, and the audio support. So with that, um, welcome to everybody. It's great to be here. I'm really looking forward to it myself. And I want to turn it over to Maggie Levenstein, the director of ICPSR. Thank you, David. And thank you to everybody for coming. I'm really excited about this event. I will keep this short, because I think we really want to get to our, our panelists. Um, and, uh, and we already made them wait till Michigan time, even though we're ending it. So um, let me just say, tell you a couple things. The first is um, today's panel um, uh, session is examining the effects of gentrification. Um, and we have, uh, as, as David mentioned, it is, uh, it, is, it is the very first event of, um, uh, of this, un this year's um, MLK Symposium. Um, our panel of experts will explore the effects of gentrification on neighborhoods and individuals from their various professional and personal perspectives, including sociology, social work, population studies, architecture, and design. I think this is a great panel. And one of the things I really like about having a discussion like this is that people often feel like gentrification is something which happens to them. And I'm hoping that having these various perspectives will help us to un understand better how we can all influence and uh, um, have agency in determining the future of the communities in which we live. So I think this is a great topic um, for us to talk about both as social scientists and as uh, community participants. I do want to remind you all about the event that we're having next week. You should have a card like this on your de on your chair as well as the, the index card for you to um, write down questions. We will have a film showing next week of the movie Class Divide. We will be showing this at the beautiful, Michigan Theater, one of my favorite places in Ann Arbor, at 603 East Liberty. It's at noontime on January 7th. Um, and then uh, there will be a discussion after the movie with Peter Moskowitz, who was the author of How to Kill a City. Um, he will be there. He will be signing books. You can buy the books. Um, and uh, and you can watch and you can watch the movie and not buy the book. Um, um, but but admire the beautiful organ and as well as uh, and see actually that is the Michigan Theater is a wonderful example of how a community came together to preserve some of its uh, its own history and create a community institution a durable community institution um, when in the face of um, of of urban change. Um, so please join us next week again. That's January 17th at noon at the Michigan Theater for Class Divide. Um, what else, is there anything else was to say? Um, I, I think the next thing I want to do is to introduce the moderator of our panel discussion, who is Dr. Keisha Moore. She's an associate professor of sociology at Drew University in New Jersey. Um, she received her PhD in sociology with a certificate in urban studies from the University of Pennsylvania, as well as a master's in social work from the University of Michigan, um, and an undergraduate degree from, in psychology from Franklin and Marshall, also in Pennsylvania. 
Um, she studies race and class stratification, urban neighborhoods, and the symbolic construction of identity, and has conducted research on community development in urban neighborhoods, interclass relations within the black community, the role of churches in community development, and the impact of welfare reform. And I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Moore to lead us from here on. Thank you all. So good afternoon. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. I'm so excited to see all the people who've come out for this exciting and important conversation. And I've had a chance to speak with some of the panelists um, a little bit earlier today. And I can just tell you, you are in for a treat. So <laughs> let me share with you the order of events. So. Um, We'd like to reserve as much time as possible for us to have a conversation with you where you'll be able to ask questions and make comments that are important to you, so please do keep those cards with you. Uh, the way that we'll introduce ourselves is I will, I and each of the panelists will take, let's take about three minutes to go through our introductions one by one, give you our official bio, and really talk with you about why this topic is important to us individually. And then I have a series of questions that I've prepared to jumpstart the conversation on gentrification, and I've um, allotted about 15 minutes for us to have that conversation around that particular type of um, issue, and then we'll move on to another issue. So we wanna try to get as much material covered as we can in our short period of time, and then we're going to turn it over to you to ask the brilliant questions that you have for the panelists. So um, that's the order. If you find me maybe cutting off a panelist, um, please, I'm not trying to be rude, I just wanna make sure that we have enough time to get to your question. So you can circle back and panelists can continue to elaborate, but this is such a big topic and there's so many exciting angles to explore it from. So we'll get started with just saying a little bit about who we are, why we're here, why gentrification is important to us. So I'll start it off and then I'll turn it over to Ms. Little to introduce her, no, Ms. Brown will start this way and go down um, to introduce herself and, and talk about what it is. So you've already heard my official bio. I am an um, associate professor of sociology at Drew University. But how I got into gentrification is that I grew up in Philadelphia, which is a city of neighborhoods. And at the time that I grew up, like we played in the streets, I took, um, I ran errands and went to the store for the older people in my community. Um, I knew, I was a paper girl on my block. I knew everyone, everyone knew me. We had block parties like every other week um, in the summer and community was a very important part of my life. It was my extended family. And by the time I became a teenager in the 80s, something happened. And we stopped being able to have block parties because there was a lot of violence. Um, people stayed in their houses more. And I felt that loss. I didn't understand what it was or what was driving it, but I could feel it. And I wanted other people to be able to experience the vibrancy of community and what it added to my life. And so that kind of sent me on a quest to understand what happened to urban neighborhoods, and more importantly, how could we bring back this experience of community? Um, which, in my dissertation, when I was studying some people who were trying to do this in Philadelphia, and I was writing about this as the black American dream, and people kept telling me, oh, you're studying gentrification. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm studying this other thing. Um, and so we'll be able to get into that around, you know, what is gentrification and community development. But that was kind of how I came to this issue. Uh, Ms. Brown, you wanna? Hi, my name is Shana Brown. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Oh, thank you for responding. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I am a recent graduate from the Sam School of Art and Design. And so when I would come home for the summer, especially my freshman year, um, I would look around and it would be construction and new businesses growing in downtown Detroit and I'm like, what was happening? And my mom told me, she looked at me and she told me, this isn't for us, this is for tourists. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> um, and so I started to do research on it and I found out that it was called gentrification. So my junior year, I did an independent study on gentrification. I did a hand lettering um, book about it. And then my senior year, it came up again, funny enough, in a class that I was taking about vampires. 
In this class, I was required to do blog posts, and one was on capitalism, and I decided to focus that on gentrification just because, to a certain degree, I think gentrification is the epitome of the worst of capitalism. Is a big guy coming in and step on the little guy. Um, and that's what really got me into gentrification. I ended up writing a post, gentrification is the real vampire, and that's what got me here. Um, and I just think it's important to learn about it and to know about it because you always need to know about anything and everything that will affect you. Hi, my name is Tam Perry. I'm going to be really fast for my three minutes. So I'm a faculty member at Wayne State School of Social Work. I'm also affiliated with ISR and the Institute of Gerontology at Wayne. I'm also a part of the Michigan Center for Urban African American Aging Research, so part of my work stems from that. Um, and uh, uh, let's see. So what my research in the last few years has been following older adults who have been displaced to do their Section 8 HUD housing going market rate. Um, and it was really actually very hard to find people displaced. So uh, a single building, uh, about over 100 seniors were uh, displaced, and we found 44 of them. And now we have funding to, to follow up interviews to find out what's happened. And so in a lot of ways, my research, um, and I'm actually a graduate of Michigan in the Social Work and Anthropology Department here, um, really looks at what are the impacts, uh, the individual impacts on people, including um, their mental health needs, um, what kind of information or services do people need? Um, and then um, also, you know, what is its impact on health? So also, I guess I think of myself as a researcher who's, who looks at the, the intersection of homes and housing, housing and health. And, um, and then also, you know, what happens when people lose their support networks or their community changes? So even if you move a mile, how does that change your life, including your relationship to your doctors, your pharmacies, your place of worship, et cetera? I guess in addition to that, I'm very active in a group in Detroit called Senior Housing Preservation Detroit. I brought brochures. People can pick them up. Um, and what's really great about this group is um, we've been meeting since every month since uh, November 2013. And so as the city has been changing, we've been really taking an eye on uh, what's happening to senior housing in the city. Um, and so we maintain a database of all the HUD, HUD um, housing units and when they're gonna, their contracts are gonna expire. So we're very concerned about when, when HUD contracts expire, people or owners are not choosing to renew them but are uh, uh, because it's profitable to convert it to market rates. So we're very much looking at that. And then I guess, um, our group has been involved with a couple of big things in Detroit that's happened in September, which is sort of Detroit created a housing trust fund. Um, Detroit has an ordinance that 20% of any new buildings has to have 20% affordable units. And then there has to be, uh, uh, they pass an ordinance to do stronger notification processes because one of the things we found is that people, when they get notified that you're gonna be displaced, that it was very uncertain and people weren't <coughs> clear and due to sort of literacy rates and stress of Titan. So we've been working on that notification process. And I guess um, I would just say that um, I'm very active in, in sort of understanding uh, seniors both living in high rise like, uh, HUD housing as well as in the neighborhoods in Detroit. And so that's my area of interest. Hello, uh, my name is Sandra Little. I'm an architect and co-founder of Centric Design Studio. We are an architectural firm that's located in Midtown Detroit. Um, we are coming up on our 10-year anniversary of our architectural firm. Uh, so 2008, November 2018 is our 10-year anniversary. Uh, we, um, um, for the, well actually, as in the last couple of months at the end of 2017, are now an award-winning architectural firm which is a big thing. So we won, uh, oh, okay. uh, so we won awards for uh, a couple small projects that are in, is in the city. Um, uh, an art gallery, David Klein Art Gallery, located in uh, downtown Detroit, right off of Washington Boulevard. And uh, Tech Town, uh, first floor renovation, which is a co-working space uh, that our firm designed, a 20,000 square foot co-working space and event center for that entity there which is also uh, the location of our office. So our office is located on the third floor of that building in, in Suites 360. Um, and we've kind of gotten a niche of being known for this uh, uh, community-based, uh, uh, collaborative, 
uh, type of architectural firm uh, that's kind of feet on the ground, grassroots. Uh, so we get a lot of our clientele that way. Uh, we also, um, the, the, I'm a co-owner of the firm. My, my business partner is also a minority. We met at Lawrence Technological University. His name is Damon Thomas. Uh, and that's where we've known each other for the last over 20, 20 something years. Uh, and started our practice uh, in 2008 during the recession with the idea that there was nowhere to go but up. <laughs> uh, I am one of 403 licensed women, African American women architects in the nation. Wow. So, and and if, if, if other uh, minority architects are in, in the room, they can get mad because I don't know my number. All the other uh, <laughs> licensed women, African American architects, know their number, so I have to I have to do my research and get my what number I am out of the 403. Um, but that saying that, um, continuing the pipeline of uh, minorities in the profession of architecture is a key mission of our firm. So we employ every summer, every year, a new intern, be it in high school student, um, actually the Henry Ford um, High School, uh, the Henry Ford Academy at CCS, their high school is like a block away from our office. So we've had two students in our uh, office who are both minority um, that were interested in architecture, had to do 50 hours of, of actual work time in a real setting as part of their curriculum. Uh, and both of those students are now currently enrolled in, um, in college. Uh, one is enrolled at CCS in interior design program, the other one is enrolled at um, University of South Carolina uh, in architectural engineering. Um, we've also had a U of M grad in our office, uh, Kristen Collins. She came right before she started college in, at here at U of M. Uh, and then um, she is currently now enrolled in her graduate uh, program at Cornell for urban planning. So just continuing that, that, uh, that pipeline to get people at the table who uh, understand the planning and things that are going on in the community is kind of how I got at the table. Um, I'm, I'm kind of like Keisha said, I believe I'm fighting on the side of community design and doing what's best for the community. I hadn't thought about it as gentrification, so uh, <laughs> that's kind of how I Hi everyone, I'm Lydia Wilden. I'm a uh, PhD candidate in sociology and public policy here at University of Michigan. Um, I'm also a research scholar for the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy over in the Ford School, um, and I'm a Population Studies Center trainee here in ISR. Um, and I guess how I, I've studied, my research is generally about neighborhood change and what are the patterns that guide neighborhood change over time, um, and how do those patterns that maybe were predicted back when neighborhood change research was really in its heyday uh, predict gentrification or fail to predict gentrification and what does that mean for models as we go forward. Um, and so one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is um, trying to understand the relationship between how neighborhoods change and how people think about neighborhoods and how they're changing. And I came to that in part because I, in my previous life, uh, lived and worked in Washington, D.C. I bought a home in Washington, D.C. in a neighborhood called Trinidad, which is just off of H Street, for anyone who's familiar. Um, and when I bought that house, people came up to me and said, you know, Trinidad, it, isn't that the neighborhood with military-style checkpoints to get in and out? You know, very, very dangerous. And I thought that was interesting, because the people who were saying that were not people who were from the neighborhood. Uh, they were not people who were living in D.C. at the time when those checkpoints really did exist. There was a lot of gang violence in the neighborhood in the mid-2000s. Um, and so, you know, I was trying to understand, well, where does this reputation of the level of danger in that neighborhood come from, and why is it so sticky, whereas H Street, which is five blocks away, has a reputation that is, you know, this is an up-and-coming neighborhood. This neighborhood is really desirable. Um, you know, so why are some neighborhoods experiencing really sticky, negative reputations, whereas others are seeing their neighborhood reputations sort of changing really quickly, fluidly, and, and um, you know, with some degree of ease? So I, part of what I try to study is, um, you know, how, nefer, how neighborhood reputations change over time, what um, people have to perceive to understand that their neighborhoods are changing, and how those perceptions to sort of cause people to make residential choices, whether that's to move or to stay. Um, so I have a couple of projects that are looking at that. 
one is just trying to understand how do perceptions change over time. we have a lot of theories that suggest that people are making residential choices based on what they believe about a neighborhood. but then once they're in that neighborhood, the neighborhood isn't static. so are they adapting those beliefs about the neighborhood as it changes? or do they just sort of say, this is what i think about this place and as long as i'm here, that's what i'm going to think. so that's one of my projects. and another project um is a survey that's in chicago, los angeles, and washington, d c. and it's trying to understand um the mental schemas that people use to understand neighborhoods and their desirability. so you know how do people think of neighborhoods in terms of prestige? do people of the same backgrounds all think a particular neighborhood is the best in the city and a particular neighborhood is the worst in the city? or does that really matter based on background, exposure? um you know what they do, how much money they make. um so i have a survey that's about to hit the field that's trying to understand that and and sort of the stickiness of neighborhood reputations. thank you. i told you it's going to be exciting. <laughs> um so let's start with that first um conversation question and i'd like for ms. walden to actually lead this and the other panelists to join in. and this is the question that we're getting at is where does gentrification fit in this trajectory of neighborhood change? so there are lots of communities that are changing and are all of them gentrifying? is that the only kind of neighborhood change? so what's the relationship between words like gentrification and urban revitalization and community development? and you know how can we tell if a neighborhood is gentrifying? is it about you know the changes in property value is it about the presence of whole foods is it in starbucks is it do you have a doggy doggy park like what are the key indicators that allow us to know this is gentrification and not something else please yeah so i think uh in thinking about this question i think i'm going to answer the first part or the last part first um which is how do we know if a community is gentrifying and i want to start out by saying gentrification is an extremely loaded term and it's also an extremely confused term. um i think if you look at uh sort of academic studies of gentrification versus how politicians talk about it versus how the public understands it to be happening, you just see a lot of inconsistencies. and i think that those inconsistencies uh you know sometimes create frustration, people sort of talking past each other. but the reality is that gentrification can mean a lot of different things. it's sort of everyone agrees that it's happening, but no one really seems to agree on what it is. so i'm going to offer sort of a broad definition of gentrification and then i invite my fellow panelists and all of you to push back on that. um so i think broadly speaking, gentrification is the socioeconomic transformation of previously low income central city neighborhoods. um and that's both due to an influx of investment and a growth of middle and upper income households. so within that really broad definition of you know a place that is low income becoming middle or upper income, there's a lot of different characteristics that can play into that and depending on who you talk to again, depending on which discipline you look at, a lot of different variables come into play. um some people would say that race is an essential part of what gentrification is and you know it's really white people moving into spaces previously held by people of color but there are some studies that suggest that middle and upper income people of color can be gentrifiers um you know there's also some studies that suggest it's you know that transition of of incomes from low income to upper income but i think a lot of studies also say students and artists and sort of lower income groups who are maybe not not the typical residents of that neighborhood but aren't necessarily upper income can be gentrifiers as well. and so i think we really have to tease out a little bit you know that gentrification maybe isn't just one thing. it might be a a a whole different a whole group of different types of neighborhood change. but to me what sort of uh connects all of these together is the pace at which a neighborhood change happens. um and in particular uh because this is what i study, uh it's the speed at which the neighborhood's reputation shifts from undesirable to desirable. um and i want to say i i don't think that this shift is organic. 
I think it's often strategically orchestrated, sometimes by nonprofits, by developers, by government, by resident groups, by businesses. Um, and I think that's in part, no one really, no one wants to live in a bad or an undesirable neighborhood. Um, but how we change those neighborhood perceptions and what that does to the market, um, I think is, is an essential aspect of how we understand gentrification. Um, so in talking about gentrification and how it fits in the broader realm of neighborhood change, um, I think one thing also to think about is when we talk about neighborhood change or gentrification, we often sort of talk about it as though a neighborhood was one way and then it changed and now it's another way. <coughs> and I think that that ignores the reality, which is that neighborhoods are dynamic. They're constantly changing all of the time. Each new resident creates a shift in the demographics of the neighborhood that maybe makes someone else want to move in, someone else want to move out. They're constantly changing, but gentrification, in my mind, is the acceleration of that change, the speed at which that, that flip happens. Um, and I think we need to understand a little bit better what the driver is of that, but we also need to contextualize that in the reality that neighborhoods experience booms and busts over time, um, like you know a lot of other different types of markets. And so I think we, we focus right now on gentrification because that happens to be the upswing that we're seeing, but let's not, remem not forget that you know, we had white flight from neighborhoods, we had incredible suburbanization trends. Um, and I'm not sure if those are the inverse of gentrification, but I think that those are important in contextualizing what this rapid transformation looks like. It's, it's also to remember how neighborhoods have changed more over time. So I'll open it up to my panelists as well. Well, um, it's, it seems like in Detroit, it's, it's, we're at a point that we're thankful for uh, a lot of things that are happening versus uh, there is concentrated development happening in Midtown and Downtown. But in the neighborhoods, they're welcoming their storefronts to be revitalized. And, uh, and that's the whole thing with, with uh, the beginning phases is the phase that everybody loves. Everybody wants the storefronts to be reactivated. They want uh, the community development corporations to uh, help out with uh, stabilization and getting neighborhoods in and traction. Um, and the coffee shops are coming, small businesses are being activated. But then uh, when the, the next phase of gentrification comes in and there starts to be the, the income shift, um, there seems like that that's where the rift comes. And then the small businesses that were there before are now being replaced by um, uh, the new, the new uh, corporate brand of coffee shop versus the local brand of coffee shop. Uh, and then that's when it's not so nice again. So uh, one of the things that I was interested in when we we're going to talk on the panel, I was very excited how do we could talk about, since we we're early on in Detroit, how to cur curtail some of those uh, those issues that come up in the later phases. Because like right now, we're excited about, and especially from an architectural and real estate side, we're excited about uh, the, the things that are starting to happen in the city and the programs that are coming on. Uh, and it's kind of in the back of the mind of mm -hmm. this this could come. But like you said, how do we fight those? How do we combat those? I think what are the net, you know, where do the people move to? What are the next, if gentrification is just part of this continuous wave of neighborhood change, what is the next neighborhood? Where are people moving to? You know, if you think about artists and students being maybe the initial gentrifiers, those people eventually will get displaced as well or move out because prices will start to go up. And so it's, I think of it more in sort of this constant uh, cycle, this constant uh, movement. And you know, it's interesting to think about where those people, where where the outgrowth will be. I guess we're so I think about, um, first of all, sort of an idea of belongingness. So, so what you mentioned about people's, your mother saying, the change is not for us. So I guess all through my interviews um, and just sort of in communities I've been in touch with, people say, oh, all those changes that are glossy, they don't, we're not going into those stores. We're, we're not going to go to new sports arenas, et cetera. And, um, and you know, it's it's something that is, and I think, so that's one thing, is sort of this this experience of belongingness that's really, people are, uh, are really examining right now in Detroit. 
Second thing, because um, when we started a group, which has uh, this coalition called Senior Housing Preservation in Detroit, one of the reasons we started it is because people, even though I do agree, well, so our, our coalition, we really thought a lot about, are we saying we're anti-development? And we then said, no, we're not. Detroit, there are a lot of benefits to bringing more uh, jobs and capital to the city. But what we did say is, you know, we're a coalition that, that really argues for thoughtful development. And the other thing is, we wanted to raise awareness that um, people are being displaced in this process. So um, for us, I told you about the senior housing, et cetera. Um, but we were really looking at, like, kind of an invisible population. Um, so in Midtown right now, and also in a, I'm from the School of Social Work there, um, you know, social service agencies are are also being displaced from Midtown because there are other things to put there. So I think in a lot of ways, um, I don't, I think it's uh, both important not to think of all gentrification as bad, but I think it's also, um, as we move forward in, in Detroit and other cities which are all changing in different ways, thinking about, well, well how can we be thoughtful about um, maybe easing the pain of it? Yeah, so I love this idea of thinking about gentrification as a very particular kind of neighborhood change that's going very quickly and has certain consequences. And so how can we think about ways to manage that or engage with that thoughtfully? And so I would like the panelists um, to respond. And, and Ms. Little, I would love if you could lead the discussion in thinking about what are the costs and benefits with this particular kind of um, neighborhood change with gentrification and what are some of the ideas that you might have around how we can um, manage it in a way that more people get to enjoy the benefits without some of the cost. So please, your That's thoughts. That's a tough question. <laughs> um, well, definitely uh, from, an, from a development side of the picture, from uh, the architecture and the uh, developers and real estate agents side. There, um, Detroit had, everybody said if, if, if the rest of the nation has a, a cold, Detroit has the flu. So it, there was a, a, when I started my firm in 2008, when there was a, a, a great, uh, a, the, well, they call it a recession. Um, there was, a, the, from a standpoint of architectural work, uh, there was a lot of work outside of the state of Michigan. Um, uh, right before I started my firm, I was doing projects in Las Vegas, uh, $26 million pools in Las Vegas, uh, that we're struggling here in Detroit to get a $8 million Port Authority building built uh, on the riverfront. So it was just a great disparity in what was happening from the rest of the world or the rest of the country and Detroit. So. It's just like from, from that standpoint, everybody from the capitalism side is very excited about things that are happening in Detroit and want to keep it going. And he's like I said, how do you skirt tail the danger of how far they go as basically the more money you make? Um, will, it, will things continue to, to snowball? Uh, we hope not, but you know, but we still have, uh, the percentage is going down a, a lot, but there's still a lot of abandoned, empty buildings in downtown Detroit. and just to see those come back online. Uh, that is a great benefit. The projects that are come out of downtown, the David Whitney building being renovated. Um, we just uh, worked on a project uh, with a uh, larger local firm, uh, uh, Quinn Evans and Associates, uh, 139 Cadillac. And the storefront had been activated for years. The 7-Eleven is downtown, right on the corner of, uh, uh, is that Randolph and Cadillac Square, right across from the Wayne County uh, old historical building had been there for years, but above, the old office space above has been empty, 10 floors of office space just sitting there empty. So now that's being renovated into 46 residential units, but it's not it's, it's not coming on as affordable housing units. So it's like, um, but you know, it's, it's good to see that building activated. So that's definitely a positive thing. And the things that are happening with the M1 rail and transit, uh, being in the main, where they said 7.2 uh, 7 downtown is, is amazing to see. So all of those, uh, and, and, and the crime rate going downtown is being lower. I mean, I my office being in Midtown, 
I mean, they brag upon the fact that there's not been a car break in uh, in our area um, uh, in, in years. So um, just all of that positive, positive energy that's happening downtown, um, attracting people down there. The co-working space that we worked on when we first started it, there were a couple businesses down there. Now this just bustling actually from all the way from seven in the morning to, and I've walked out of my office at 11 at night and, <laughs> and there's people still uh, down, downstairs in the co-working space and working. So to see that activation um, is definitely a lot of the, 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 the great benefits of the city. And, and, and being able to have small businesses start in co-working spaces that can't afford that overhead of having a larger office, uh, being able with these new models that are coming on, uh, being able to get their businesses off the ground. And that was one of the big things that helped our firm get our start. So all of those are, to me, are great, uh, great benefits of things that are happening um, beyond the fact of, you know, the stadiums and the big projects like those. So those it's like a difference to me. It's like the tourist version of the stadium. And, but there are other things that are happening that are just great uh, to the small businesses and to the local economy to me that are uh, amazing. Any comments? Any other panelists want to jump in? If not, let me um, move the conversation to thinking about the way in which neighborhoods shape our lives. So uh, we live in a time where people say, you know, community doesn't matter so much because we're all plugged in and, you know, we can communicate with people all over the world. And so where we live, the neighborhood isn't so important in terms of shaping our life trajectory. And yet there are particular populations of people, especially young people and older people, for whom the neighborhood remains a really important um, facet in circumscribing their life. And so I'd like for uh, Dr. Perry to lead our discussion in thinking about how neighborhood change, in particular the changes that are brought around gentrification, impact these populations that are vulnerable and that are very much um, shaped by uh, the lives of the neighborhood. And uh, Ms. Little already started us in the conversation of neighborhood safety, so how gentrification influences that and how gentrification influences community institutions like schools, public schools. So when you come back next week um, for the event Class Divide, the film, it'll be all around you know, public schools and the impact of gentrification on public schools. So I'm wondering if, um, Dr. Perry, if you could just start us out in thinking about the role of gentrification in shaping the lives of these very special parts of our community. Yeah, I appreciate that. Also, I will say yesterday I had a meeting with the director of housing for the city of Detroit, and he asked me, how, do gentr how does, what are the special needs or particular needs of older adults when you think about relocation? So I think in a lot of ways, um, there are, for people who are more vulnerable, potentially more vulnerable things you have to think about. Um, but I would guess I would go back to um, the research project I did, and I, I'll tell you a little bit about um, how it was created. So my uh, uh, the project I did when I found people who were displaced is it was a community-based participatory research project with two community partners, one St. Aloysius Church in downtown Detroit, and two United Community Housing Coalition, which is, I think, the only sort of or the biggest housing, uh, they also work on foreclosure issues in the city, uh, and tenant organizing. Um, and so I guess one of the ways we found the people who got displaced is because the church had a relationship with the seniors in the building because they delivered free groceries. So it was, it was very interesting, though I thought it would be very difficult to find people who were displaced um, in a way these connections they had to this church, and they being my research partner, actually facilitated it. Um, and even we were calling yesterday, like, oh, we want to come back and find out. And I think the church's relationship, and I would even say standing in that community, and its relationship to the building was a big part of how we got our, our research project going. But moreover, um, I think people, um, people have connections to place and space. Um, and actually, it's in my brochure, so I'm going to just refer to it a minute. Uh, actually, uh, we, we actually have listed all the ways people are affected as older adults, so I'll just go through it. 
So in, in a way, you know, people, older adults often contribute to their communities. So thinking about how your contributions would change if you got displaced or the, um, things change. So, you know, so, something certainly in Detroit, but in other places, grandparents raising grandchildren is a, is a particular resource that when people get displaced, that those permutations have to change or can change. Um, also, I think um, people's uh, networks, including um, their places of worship and them changing, or where their family members are in relation to where they are, the, all that has to be examined. And I think one of the important things about to think about is how gentrification probably affects people differentially, so that some people, um, if they're told they, you know, uh, they have to be moved, um, they can figure it out. They can figure out how to apply for a new apartment. They can figure out how to maintain a HUD voucher, which is actually fairly hard. And then other people really need other people to support these processes, either family members or, or maybe um, social workers or other uh, support staff. I would say yesterday we talked to the director of housing about the creation of a senior citizens department for housing that really would help people with these transitions because we know they're really hard. And, and so um, in a lot of ways, I can't speak as much to children, but I would say, um, you know, attention to vulnerable populations in gentrification sort of milieus, I would say is really important. And I think the other thing our, our coalition would argue for is, is sort of, uh, I guess it's our motto, uh, Detroit for all ages, which is this idea that if you also look at the contributions older people make to a city and also older Detroiters who have stayed with the city through very long decades of hard times, you know, now that it's sort of prospering, what does it mean that you're displacing some of them, right? And so I think it's also um, something for a community to also look at its value system. I'll stop there. Um, I think it's interesting because until your video that you sent yesterday, I never even thought of how gentrification displaced the elderly. Just because most of my research, it tended to be on minorities and people of color. And it was never mentioned of elderly. And I thought about that and how crappy that is as people who have been long-term residents, people who have lived here for decades and truly consider this place their home can so easily be uprooted just because something needs to be developed or built. I, I think it's interesting um, the fact that uh, working and helping churches to uh, create housing projects mm -hmm. um, and create and them being the anchor to the neighborhood uh, and try to keep as many people, even if they're coming out of their single family home mm -hmm. and they need help, if they could come into a larger facility that's in a neighborhood that's anchored by a church, you could keep that sense of community that they mm -hmm. need. Uh, but I, I'm kind of uh, uh, the same way. I did not think about, uh, I, I, I've done senior housing, uh, but I have not thought about the displacement of seniors. So learning about, uh, Tam, your, res your research and your, uh, uh, services that are out there is now I feel like you're part of my network so I can when people ask me or you know anything about it now I have somewhere somewhere to go and uh, and, uh, and bring them uh, some information so I mean I think it's awesome the work that you're doing and uh, but I think that's a, a key churches are a key area to uh, keep uh, neighborhoods together and whole one of our clients is uh, Narden Park um, there is the uh, Ebenezer, Ebenezer AME Church, and it's been there forever. Uh, and they are—they already own one uh, piece of housing uh, that they've kept going for a number of years. But now the city is actually, City of Detroit Planning, is talking to them about there's other opportunities within your neighborhood to use to bring on another housing project. So we did a planning exercise to look at around them, you know, how much, and they looked at it from a financial standpoint, how much housing could they afford to take on as an entity and then what other housing opportunities are there for the city to then uh, turn around and maybe bring in some other developers to help anchor that area in the neighborhood. I think that's a good approach. I think it's interesting. I was thinking about this as Ms. Little was speaking as well. Um, we talk a lot about displacement and as the quantitative researcher on the panel, one of the things that's interesting and part of this frustrating duality between what uh, sort of data shows us about gentrification compared to what people on the ground know to be true about gentrification is that academics have actually found that 
displacement doesn't really seem to happen at a higher rate in gentrifying neighborhoods than in non-gentrifying neighborhoods. I think that that's really interesting and sort of complicated for us to grapple with. Um, you know, what does it mean for the data to not uphold what we know to be true? And in fact, some of what uh, research shows us is it's not lower income people who are pushed out of gentrifying neighborhoods, but homeowners who say, oh, my investment is suddenly worth a lot more, I'm gonna sell. And so a lot of the displacement that we see is actually um, upper income people leaving. But of course, that's not the story that Dr. Perry finds when she talks to her seniors. Um, and so I think you know, squaring that with uh, data is it's a really complicated story I think the one thing um, that I found that sort of uh, speaks to what dr. Perry is is talking about is that it's not only who is displaced and if people are displaced but what happens once they are displaced um, you know so for maybe it's a smaller portion of people who ha end up having to leave the neighborhood than we think but there's a differential um, outcome for low-income people who are moving out of gentrifying neighborhoods and upper-income people who are moving out of gentrifying neighborhoods. And what we find is that low-income people who move out of gentrifying neighborhoods end up in worse neighborhoods, which means they end up with worse schools, with higher crime uh, communities, you know, possibly further from work. Um, and so their outcomes end up being you know, disproportionately worse than the people who are homeowners who are sort of saying, my neighborhood is improving, I can get a lot more money for this house than I originally paid for it, they maybe move to the suburbs, and so they end up not, you know, they probably move at a higher rate, but they don't see the same ty types of negative, uh, negative consequences, rather. Um, and so I think, you know, putting all of that in context, are people actually being displaced? There's a question to the scale that w at which that's happening, but those who are, you know, who's, who is really, um, suffering from that and who is benefiting. I think that's part of the conversation that's important to have. And I think another thing, uh, just like housing, uh, home, homes are commodity, so are housing vouchers, so yeah. are housing vouchers. So I think another part of the story, certainly in Detroit, is sort of who has individually based uh, housing vouchers or building based housing vouchers and how is that changing due to both. Um, so in our, in the study we did, some people didn't understand what was happening, so they actually forfeited their housing voucher in, because it was too confusing of a process. So that's why we would argue for sort of people need to be supported better through this process um, because it is confusing. And then I guess um, in a lot of ways, we know that there aren't new HUD housing vouchers coming out. So if they're lost, they're lost to the city or to cities. Um, in, it feels a permanent way. So how does that? So, and then, of course, there's just sort of the inadequacy of affordable housing in general in our country, right? So we're already in sort of a, um, we already have such a great need for more affordable housing. And then so I think in a lot of ways, um, trying to hold on to what Detroit has is part of uh, thinking about this too. But I do, I do agree that, that uh, and I guess the other thing, uh, which reminded me of sort of a voluntary move, my dissertation, I studied older adults who voluntarily moved. Um, and so when I started this project on people who were forced, we call it forced displacement. Like it's, uh, what I, I remember back to when people were voluntarily moving is it was hard, very hard in different ways. Like it was very hard to sort through all your possessions. It was very hard to figure out if you were getting a good price for your house, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you add on things like you're forced to do it and you have to do it within a certain time frame, et cetera. Um, so yeah, it's very complicated. And so as we've been thinking about the role of gentrification and perhaps um, mitigating inequality, actually bringing some resources and opportunities to neighborhoods and places that have historically been disinvested and that haven't had these resources, um, but also exacerbating inequality and perhaps forcing some of the more vulnerable members of the community out. I'd like us to kind of dig a little bit more deeper in that um, dynamic. And I'm really excited for uh, Ms. Brown to lead the discussion here, uh, because what I'd like to invite the panelists to think about is focusing particularly on race and the role of racial inequality and gentrification. Um, and I'd like for our discussion to include not just 
displacement, but also what it means to live in these spaces where, as Dr. Perry is talking about now, you may not feel like you belong anymore. This isn't my space, right? So what does it mean to be in a neighborhood where perhaps the people who are coming there don't have the same kind of community ethos or your daily interactions in your life is different in these community institutions? We talked a little bit about public safety um, and crime rates going down in neighborhoods that are gentrifying, uh, but is it, what does it mean in terms of everyone's safety, right? Because some people have, in gentrifying neighborhoods, been talking about the experience of worse interactions with um, police officers. And so I'd just love for the panelists and Ms. Brown, if you could lead us in unpacking what the experience of living in a gentrifying neighborhood is, particularly around these kinds of social inequalities. That was a large question, <laughs> but I'll try to answer the first part um, first. So I think to a certain degree, gentrification exacerbates social and racial inequality, um, just because the new people coming in tend to be a different class. They tend to be middle or upper middle class, um, and they typically are white, not always. And they tend to move in these, they move into the city or they take a job in the city, um, but the parts of the city that they tend to move into are these very specific places. They're downtown or midtown. They're not like the east side of Detroit in different areas to really branch out and create a diversity in the actual city. It's just in this one centralized location where there are these people coming in. Um, and so I don't think that helps with people's transition to a certain extent because it's almost like when you drive through Detroit, it's you know, black, 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 you get to a certain point and then you start seeing other people of different races and there's not enough interaction and commingling um, with other areas of the city. And I think that doesn't help with the interactions between long-term residents feeling comfortable with all of these new people and all these new opportunities coming in. And that's the benefit of, is there are these new opportunities and that's great for the youth to a certain degree because they're like quick and loans um, they employ tons of people, and a lot of their employees tend to be only from have high school diplomas, and that's great because they offer benefits, and that's not typical now for a high school diploma to have a stable job and a job that isn't a blue collar worker. Um, so I think that's one of the benefits, um, and. I think the, the gentrifiers just want to be a part of the community, but it's hard when you're only seeing this idyllic part of Detroit, just because the crime rate is low there and there isn't enough um, diversity in that as well. Does that make sense? Would any of the other analysts like to speak to this before we go on? About the experience of gentrification? Well, I would say I have a lot of students I teach. And so I've talked to my students about how finding places in Midtown as a student is harder and harder. So people um, who don't intend to be commuters, and Wade State is certainly a commuter school, but they're having to live further and further away from campus. And so it is interesting, um, and actually um, this summer I was at the International Gerontology meetings where someone raised the question, okay, this is fairly controversial, but um, how are higher ed institutions part of gentrifying processes? And and um, and so Wayne State is clearly in Midtown, and uh, no, and I guess I think of it. I, don't, I have no idea sort of what the the university's plans are as far as uh, uh, acquiring buildings, but also thinking it in, uh, from the student experiences, you know, students who I have who are homeless who are living in shelters because affordability in Midtown is impossible for them with their tuition cost too. And so I guess um, in a lot of ways, um, you know, I, I think um, the, uh, the other thing I would say, uh, I was talking to a director of a large nonprofit in Detroit recently, and he, uh, he serves a very vulnerable population. And he says now in Midtown, it's impossible to convince landlords to take the population he serves because Honestly, it's, it's actually very hard for anyone to get housing in Midtown. It's, it's occupancy rate, my understanding is like between 95 and 98 percent. So, so then if you have a vulnerable population, right, and someone, or if you have people with criminal background, um, 
it's even harder to find housing. Um, so I guess I could uh, give those details. Um, one of the things I think about is there's a book called uh, uh, There Goes the Hood uh, by Lance Freeman. Uh, and he uh, talks about just gentrification between the same, between races that are the same. So it could be an African American from a underserved uh, population that is now being replaced by upper middle class, middle class, African Americans moving in the neighborhood. Um, and the, the the people who are moving in don't think of themselves as gentrifiers because look, I'm moving into an African American neighborhood. Um, it's just it's more, you know, I want to live closer to, to downtown or I want to live, you know, closer to whatever amenity that it is that is attracting them, and they don't look at themselves as gentrifiers. The other thing is too that you have a a generational um, difference. So you may have older people that are there. Um, that have more of a history of the neighborhood, have more of the history of why things are the way they are, and that's not even in the mindset of the new person that's moving in. So there's a, a, a slight tension that's created just because of that difference. Um, there's so many different dynamics that can come into play uh, when you talk about from the experience side of, of gentrification. It's hard to almost uh, ca categorize all those different experiences that people can t can get. But the history uh, portion of it is, is tough uh, to, even from an African-American standpoint, um, I, I feel like that we're, in, we're just in, at the point of starting to document um, some of the things that are critical to our history. Uh, and then to, for that to be an educational piece for the people to follow behind. So you're like almost talking about uh, kind of a hidden figure situation, like where you know where are these these uh, the pieces of the puzzle that will help other people understand when they come to a neighborhood what's important to them, what's um, and why it's important to them, and then you you basically don't even know. If, here's another hood term: if you're disrespecting them or not based on the fact because you don't understand the history of where they're coming from with their their ideas and context. So it's a uh, it's a it can create it can create a lot of tension. Just uh, the experience. I think um, I'm going to speak from personal experience as a gentrifier who lives in Midtown <laughs> um, and somehow manages to afford one of those pretty expensive apartments. Um, that I, I think you know what's most important is to contextualize the space that you're occupying, and I think that that's true whether or not it's a gentrifying neighborhood or just you know any any of the other different types of changing neighborhoods and environments that we live in. Um, you know, when people ask me where I live, I first and foremost say Cass Corridor, um, and then I say Midtown. And for people who don't know the distinction, Midtown is what this area of Detroit is called now, but in um, you know the era of urban renewal, when a lot of the highways were built in, uh, in Detroit, um, the Cass Corridor was a space that was basically carved out by highways so that it was an island sort of unto itself. And in that process, a lot of the social services ended up being concentrated in that space, which meant that there was a lot of um, people who required those social services, a lot of homeless people, a lot of drug addicts, a lot of prostitution happening in that space. And so when Dr. Perry talks about the displacement of social services from Midtown, from Cass Corridor, what's really important to understand is that they're being displaced from a place that they were sort of forced into in the first place. We have to think about that history of how policy has moved people and services and amenities from place to place um, and why that's happening. Um, I was in a talk recently and someone said, you know, you should look around yourself sort of anytime you are in a space and just notice who's around you. And when you're in a space that is entirely of the same race that you are, you're in a racially constructed space. And just con just noticing that, I think, is an important first step. You know, as someone who lives in Midtown, I often notice when I walk into a space, am I surrounded by a diverse group of people here, or am I the only white person here, or am I, you know, amongst a sea of other white people and there are no people of color. And what does that tell me about who this space is being marketed to, who it's sort of constructed for? Um, and just, you know, maybe I don't challenge that in the moment, but thinking about, you know, what does that tell me about 
this neighborhood and how can i understand better sort of the history that led to that um it's a first step it's not a radical step but i think it's a first step in understanding sort of where we are i think it's also important to think of home and work but also third spaces so parks and public <clears throat> spaces so like uh in detroit the state takeover of bell isle mm -hmm. uh, has, has really changed the makeup of who's using that space uh, because it requires a park permit so things like that and sort of um many older detroiters who i've spoken to spoken with um you know had many family celebrations at bella and so sort of how then how sort of state policy or sort of changes that were certainly economically driven um have impact on sort of um, family and social interactions and, and, and actually cultural practices I was trying to get uh, a shelter at Belle Isle for a reunion two years ago, and it was already booked six months in advance. <laughs> <laughs> Online. You know, it's, it's a big change. Yeah, it's, it's a, a big change. Yes, it's a, a big, big change. change. Yeah. Which brings me to my final question, and then I'm going to turn it over to our audience members to continue the conversation. Um, but we've been thinking about how spaces, all spaces, are imbued with history that's shaped by demographics, by politics, by the economy, and by meanings that we give to those spaces and we give to the people who inhabit those spaces. And so I invite the panelists to paint a picture for us. So if we say a picture is worth a thousand words, paint a picture for us of gentrification in Detroit. And then tell us what we need to learn from that picture about how not just Detroit, but all of our communities and um, how America is changing and how we can be engaged in um, shaping and reshaping spaces to be more equal, just, consistent with our communitarian values. Um, so I'll ask each panelist to take, you know, maybe just two to three minutes to just lay out a distinctive picture that you have in your mind of this is gentrification in Detroit, and this is what I want the audience to learn from this experience. I guess I'll go first. Uh, um, so uh, in 2016, I, I uh, was awarded the uh, Knights Arts Challenge for a project that I'm working on uh, called Noir Design Parti. Uh, it is a project where we're researching and documenting the history of African American architects uh, in Michigan and specifically in Detroit. So we actually conducted a tour uh, in this past uh, November uh, of in Midtown and Downtown, projects that are designed by African American architects, and basically we're in, in, in our research, we're trying to get, we're trying to get a gauge of their impact on on the city and what what African American designers have as a legacy within the city. So one of the stops on our tour, there's a there's a large concentration of African American design buildings that are along uh, Warren Avenue. So if you Warren and Woodward, so you look at you come down Warren, you have the African American Museum, uh, actually old and new. So you have the new African American Museum that is actually uh, at the corner of Warren and is that Bush? Bush? Brush. Brush. Yeah. And if you go right directly behind it is the original African American Museum that was um, designed by the same firm, Sims and Verner, that is now owned by the College of Creative Studies. Um, there are several apartment buildings that are down that street that are designed by Sims and Verner. Um, there are two churches at the end. Um, you have Plymouth, uh, that is designed by Madison. You have uh, Bethel AME. So I'm gonna focus on Bethel AME, but you have this large focus of African American design buildings along Warren. So Bethel AME is a church uh, that was built in 1971 by an architect. Uh, his name is Nathan Johnson. Uh, but Bethel AME is a church, and this was a story that was told when we stopped there during our tour, that has been displaced three times. Mm -hmm. So their church was originally in Black Bottom um, and was displaced during urban renewal. And they uh, then moved to, and I'm trying to remember where the second location is, I'm drawing a blank, but it was another area in Midtown um, that basically they rebuilt their church there. So you have a 100-year-old, it's one of the oldest AME churches in the city, 100-year-old church. 
and then their second location, the street was being widened, so they were dis they were uh, displaced again. So during that displacement, as part of their deal, they uh, were given the money to build the church that they have now at Warren and uh, and 75. So that church being there, and and in our tour and our research, we went there one Saturday and ran into a family coming out of choir rehearsal. So it was two sisters, both of them very active, they're in their 90s, and saying their their family has been in this church, basically they're celebrating their centennial, 100 year uh, this summer uh, for their family being as part of this church. But them keeping that history and that legacy through all of this movement was the part that was really amazing to me. I'm like, man, it's like, when I say churches are the center of, of things that could keep keep something together in the neighborhood, but this, this, this area along Woodward is kind of the area of displacement that happened that people are settling in now and trying to keep their history and trying to keep them there and not be displaced again is kind of a focus of what uh, I'm thinking about in my research is like how can we um, and I'm actually now on a project too that is kind of colliding with that is basically looking at uh, civil rights sites within Michigan mm -hmm. so basically from a historical standpoint and national register standpoint, how, how can we get these places preserved so they are not moved and displaced again is one uh, aspect of kind of how I'm thinking about things and how to stop the cycle. Mm -hmm. so. Wait for my mic to turn back on. <laughs> Sorry, I'm suffering from a cold. Um, I think, so one image that sticks in my mind, if you, take the 94 Expressway all the way into downtown, you'll pass the old Free Press building, which is the uh, the newspaper's old headquarters. Um, it's on Lafayette. And on top of it, there are two billboards. And one says Detroit is dot, dot, dot. And the other says TBD. So Detroit is TBD. Detroit is to be determined. And I think that image sort of shining over downtown Detroit it's a really interesting one that we should think about. Um, you know, first, Detroit is a city with a population of over 600,000 people. The idea that that city is not determined already in its present state is insulting, <laughs> is ludicrous, um, and is really problematic. Um, so, you know, I think you know, first and foremost what is that saying to the people who are already there and how is that perpetuating this myth that Detroit yeah. is sort of vacant space that's up for grabs that you know has all this opportunity if only someone would come in and do something with it yeah. there are things being done with it it is a you know thriving city that has you know forever been one of the largest metropolitan areas in in the United States um, but if you dig a little bit deeper into those billboards, what you'll learn is the uh, building that it sits on was just recently bought by Bedrock, which is the development corporation run by Dan Gilbert, who owns Quicken Loans. If you look into what TBD means, it's the new magazine, lifestyle magazine, that Dan Gilbert's firm has created to, uh, you know, sort of capture glossy pictures of Detroit and what they think Detroit should look like. So. If you go to the Instagram page, you'll see cold pressed juices and cocktail bars and um, you know luxury leather goods and things that, like, frankly, I kind of like. But I don't know that those are Detroit in its entirety. And I also don't know that that is the image that is what it would look like for Detroit to be determined. And I think that combining those things together is is dangerous. And um, you know, tells well. It maybe tells a racial story in some people's mind. It certainly tells a class story about who Detroit is for um, and what it should look like. And so I think, um, you know, it seems pretty benign. This billboard, Detroit is to be determined. But if you think about what that tells people, going back to my um, sort of working hypothesis that gentrification really has to do with how neighborhoods' reputations change over time. You know how Detroit is to be determined um, sort of sets up this idea that something different is going to come here. I think we have to we have to challenge that a little bit and think about it um, really critically, and um, you know just ask 
when you see a space that you once thought one thing about and now you think something different about, ask, you know, who drove that change? What drove that change? Am I, am I okay with it? Um, so yeah, that's the image I'll sort of leave you guys with. Um, so the image that I think about is when the Little Caesars Arena was built. Um, and right after it was built, I believe it was a concert and a game day. And it took, like, I aged a whole other year <laughs> trying to get home from downtown Detroit, where there's probably like an hour. I'm just dramatic. Um, and I think that says something to where things are invested. Um, and that there should be a, a bit of more incentives to the community for investment. So maybe if something is built, maybe you help build a school or you donate money to the police department um, and just add more to the community itself and not just businesses always here for profit. And maybe if you gave them something like that, it can actually improve some parts of the city of Detroit. I guess I'll have a different twist. Um, so long before I thought about studying gentrification processes, I spent much time thinking about older adults and their relationships to their homes. So there's a whole uh, scholars who call them sort of themselves sort of scholars who study aging in place and aging in community now as a larger uh, sort of group of scholars, where people say, how can we? Um, have homes or residences for older adults that suit their physical needs, their uh, emotional needs, sort of like near family or uh, near things they want to be in, and affordable needs and, and affordability all in one, or can it happen? Um, sometimes people never want to move, and so they, the idea of home modifications to the place they currently love is, is one option. Other people are, are um, fine to move, et cetera. So I think. In a way, for me uh, as a scholar, I still bring all that about how I think about older adults and how they think about their housing choices and housing transitions, and I bring in um, the larger context of sort of affordability has to do a lot in Detroit specifically with gentrification these days, right? And so it is a class thing. It's also sort of a perception that Detroit's a blank slate, and then, well, okay, what about all the people who live there, right? And so. Um, but this idea, I guess, uh, for the population uh, I'm interested in and also work with, um, just thinking about how can we make a city that's, that feels like it could be home for people across the lifespan. Thank you. And so now um, we get to continue the conversation uh, with questions that you have. So um, on your note cards, if you haven't already, just hold them up and we'll have some more. Do we have oh, we get to watch we the video. Okay, okay. Yeah. wonderful. Yes, yeah. so, so you've our already. Our coalition made a 10-minute okay. documentary. <laughs> Yeah, you've already heard great stuff about um, the video and, and how eye-opening it is. So we get to watch that. I think it's about 10 minutes um, yeah. while you're jotting down your questions, and then we'll have some time. And I'll, I'll let you know this film was made by Kate Levy, who made the uh, video for the Water Crisis, and then she came to Detroit and made our video. And, um, yeah. and I think I thought when we leave here, we're going up to see our Jesus. I said, yes, it'll be time. And all of a sudden, I got a picture of the sun, and so I have to move. Oh, my God, what is this? I went to Laverne, one of my good friends. He said, I was millionaires bought the building. We got to get hell off. That's the word she said. I said, what the hell are you talking about? We have to move. Yeah, no, no, not me. I'm not moving. I don't care. I went into a fit, screaming and crying. God, don't let this happen to me. Do whatever you have to do. I'm not moving. Very upset. Very, very crying. I cried a river for that. And me and my girl, her and I are still living. We didn't see Jesus. She's way out on six miles. She don't know why in the hell she was there. <laughs> I'm to look at it. Yes, I'm taking she wasn't thinking. 
I want to be near my church. I've been going to St. Aloysius since I'm eight years old. Now, I'm getting used to it little by little. Or I'll ne never be another spiritual part. I know that the developers did not want the seniors to stay in the property because they said that. When we asked, would you allow seniors to stay, they basically said, no, we don't want anybody to stay. You don't talk to people like they're trash, like there's some rotten wild drunk in the alley. Talk nice. All those different business that come to us, sarcastic, sassy, that's no way to do business. There were people who had lived there for over 30 years. They actually started renovating the property while people were still living there. People experienced great anxiety, and it was very disorienting. Most of the people that left Griswold is not down here at the Bicentennial, and I believe they're going to do the same thing to Bicentennial, by the way. One lady moved to Southfield, Sharon, and about four of them over in Bicentennial, and the rest, is, they scattered all around. Sometimes seniors are leaving to buildings where they're nearby where they used to live, so they didn't have to uh, change their pharmacies, their doctors, their neighbors, but they're moving into buildings where they're not certain if they're going to have to move. And I guess I would um, emphasize that these are people who are in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. We're moving, you know, across great upheaval. When you live in a senior citizen building, you've been there eight years or more. It's just like your new family, you know, and, and you're losing your family. And a lot of the older people in the building had nobody but us. And I'm not saying I'm not old, okay? But we checked on them every day. We cooked, we fed them, we did everything. But they wanted from from the store we went. I wonder many days how they doing now. Is somebody watching out for them? I don't know. You know, I'm not able to go check on them. But if we was all together, they would have nothing but the best. I love being over there. I even like it here because I do the same thing. Here. Same, in the same way that urban renewal displaced a lot of people. Displaced a lot of people. For many Detroiters, they're stuck with the city through lots of hard times. Many of the older adults who I meet on a daily <coughs> basis have faced historical prejudices, home ownership practices, and job opportunities that were very racialized and clearly did not provide the same opportunities for all the citizens. And the idea that now that it's um, changing, in a way it's a moral question of whether they should be welcome in the city that they have contributed so much. As the people were leaving Detroit, moving out of downtown Detroit, there were office buildings that were just being deserted, beautiful buildings. 
and the people who were actually moving into downtown detroit were these seniors and as much as downtown and midtown were basically deserted here were these pockets of of communities of seniors living in these buildings and kind of holding down the fort downtown i've been here 19 years come april 1st i moved in here 1997. I've found this, I've got it, found it behind me. So I hope things don't change. I'm, I'm Vice President of the Ocean Tower Tennis Council. We're a team in improving inside the building. But I like, see, I like to change it. It is a mix up. Of course, it's out of my price range. I, when Top Cat opened, I looked at the menu from outside. And uh, the menu said $25. No, no. 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 Chili fries was about eight dollars. Eight dollars for chili fries? No. <laughs> <laughs> is it false or is it fact? We hear a lot of talk about affordable housing, but some of the seniors that we're advocating for may not be able to afford the affordable housing that's going into place. And yet Section 8 housing is a different category in terms of uh, affordability for folks. The buildings that are project-based Section 8 allows the tenants to live in that property based on 50% <coughs> of their actual income. So if a person has uh, zero income, their rent is actually zero. So it does give a person who really has no means to live anywhere a place to live. There's no federal dollars to create new housing right now, to create new housing for this population. If an owner decides to opt out, those federal dollars are lost to the city of Detroit. So we're looking at the possible displacement of thousands of seniors if these contracts expire and if people are forced to move. Enjoy the games, you know. Eastern Market is right to the side. It's just so much where you can get fresh fruits and vegetables and in season. And they got a lot of entertainment out here for us. And, and, and if you're active like me, you really enjoy it. I'm associated with the Citizen District Corporation of West Park Map. We have a whole roadmap of uh, good things that's coming. To Brush Park. I have been through the good times, the bad times, and now the great times. I want people to realize that if you don't help your senior citizens, you don't make a way. I mean, it's like you throw them away, and you, but without the senior citizens or the older people in this world, there will be no one. I've been here since 1944. I ain't going nowhere. In your bed. Isn't that an awesome video? That was fabulous. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, One last question. I have 
have our shared self here in the back, and I also have a brand new Aqua Press, sort of the history of our coalition. And so now we have so many fabulous questions from the audience. Um, it would actually take about another hour to go through all these great questions. So what I'm going to ask the panelists to do is to just have one person um, take the question and respond uh, in you know two to three minutes as succinctly as you can so we can try to get through as many questions as possible. And um, for those of you who are here in the audience, you have the wonderful privilege that when it hits four o'clock and we end, you can come up and ask your questions individually to the panelists. For those of you who are joining us via live stream, hopefully you can email um, one of the panelists or all of them and get some of their feedback on these. But these are great questions. So, okay, let me just start by this. Um, so it's been shown that middle and upper income black individuals tend to live in neighborhoods that are segregated in majority black neighborhoods. So how does that fit into this notion that middle and upper income individuals contribute to gentrification without considering race? And let me add to that another question that seems um, related. In your opinion, is it possible for a middle class white person to move to Detroit without being a gentrifier? So both of these questions bring up the issue of can middle class people um, int integrate themselves into Detroit uh, without being gentrifiers? So who'd love to take that one? <laughs> I, I can try. Um, so I think I think if we think of gentrification as the idea of a neighborhood transitioning from one thing to another, or from one group of people to another, it's certainly possible for <laughs> middle and in upper income blacks or a middle class white person to either be a gentrifier or not be a gentrifier. I think it really depends on what the neighborhood sort of started as. Um, you, know, you have Lance Freeman's book, There Goes the Hood, um, which is about gentrification in Harlem, which was mostly driven by middle and upper income African Americans moving into Harlem. Um, you have Mary Patillo's <coughs> book, um, which is about uh, middle and upper income uh, African Americans moving into uh, the south side of Chicago and the um, sort of class wars that happened or, or class struggles that happened in that process of, um, sort of income integration. Um, so I certainly think that it's possible and that there are um, a handful of stories where you do see that. Um, I think the most classic version of gentrification is sort of the racial displacement, but I, that's certainly not always the case. Um, and then when it comes to <coughs> middle income white residents moving in um, and moving into Detroit specifically, um, I think you know, the, the Detroit aspect of that question ha in my mind has sort of two pieces to it. One, so much of Detroit is vacant or is vacant housing that doesn't have a current occupant that I think there's a question or, or an, uh, discussion to be had about, you know, if a middle income white family moves into a home that where they're not necessarily displacing anyone and where they, they might radically be changing the composition of their neighborhood, but that might in part be because the composition of their neighborhood is a very few number of people. Um, so I think that that is sort of one piece. Another piece is, you know, not every neighborhood, Detroit is a majority black city, not every neighborhood will be a low income black neighborhood. And so I think, again, it, it has to do with how is the neighborhood starting? And then also at, at what pace is that change happening? I think a slow, gradual integration um, <coughs> would fall outside of the definition of gentrification. It might fall outside of the definition of what people think of as sort of predatory changes in the housing market. Um, but I think both good questions about you know how expansive do we want to make this definition um, and where do we see sort of good and bad changes in, in uh, neighborhood development happening. Thank you. Do you feel like gentrification, if it was more widespread in Detroit, would be helpful? Or do you think that if it's widespread, it would just spread out the harmful impacts <coughs> over a larger area? 
So this person writes that although gentrification right now is pretty centralized, is it possible that that centralized gentrification is actually preserving some of the uh, history and culture in places like the east side? Um, so are there potential benefits that outweigh the potential negatives of concentrated gentrification? Um, I, I guess I would say uh, in Detroit, uh, quoting uh, one of my colleagues, Dan Patera, uh, Detroit is huge. <laughs> uh, Detroit, in its footprint, you can put uh, the city of San Francisco, Boston, and Manhattan all within the footprint of Detroit. So the scale of it is, is so vast that there has to be concentrated efforts based on the population of where it is now. Uh, and and <coughs> focusing in on those areas, I, I would think if, if Detroit uh, problem of gentrification became widespread, a lot of people would welcome that as a good thing because it's like it's so many areas of uh, vast uh, in, uh, this disparity um, within uh, the neighborhoods with houses being demoed and a couple of houses being left on the block. I could see a, I could see it being a benefit because people would be happy to have uh, that population come back in and support a city that can support um, almost two million people versus where it is now under a, a million people. So I think it would be a, a great benefit. Thank you. Our next question is around transportation. So can you talk about the importance of available and reliable public transportation in Detroit's livability and in the patterns of gentrification? Uh, it can only get better. <laughs> um, I would say uh, it's a major, uh, I mean, D Detroit, has been called a food desert. Some people that people argue about it, but it's certainly also a transportation desert. Um, you know, uh, people who are trying to get to um, midtown or downtown to access services or to attend Wayne State University per se spend hours and hours and hours on the bus um, if they work, if if it's not too crowded when you're waiting for it, uh, et cetera. So I guess. Um, you know, improving transportation, and of course, we just opened the uh, city, just opened the queue line this summer. Um, uh, people talk about sort of <coughs> where that track is and can it be enhanced or enlarged? Uh, are, are there other places? Because um, it's actually kind of far from a lot of other neighborhoods, the queue line. So mm -hmm. are there ways to sort of incorporate people who have to get to the Woodward Corridor again? Um, Thank you. So uh, our next two questions are around the politics of gentrification. Um, so the first uh, audience member says, in the last three months alone, I've been to three community organized events on gentrification from folks on the ground attempting to understand um, and to take, agen the to take agency over gentrification. So as a member of these communities, how can I help shift the conversation from pure anti-development to one that feels true but is more productive? And a related question is um, from another audience member, if gentrification is happening all over the place in all major cities, then how do we still place and provide for low-income families and this person says, affordable housing has to be supported by the government and policymakers, and um, non and not as. Wait, I'm sorry. Affordable housing has to be subsidized by the government, and policymakers are not concerned with housing low-income families. So, whichever panelist wants to take on the politics of support around gentrification. <laughs> I don't know if I have the right answer. Um, but I think when it comes to having more of a diverse conversation, you have to <laughs> value both the pros and the cons of gentrification, not just only see it as a bad thing because it does bring new business, it does bring new people, and that brings more attention to the city, which can, to a certain degree, can only be good to bring more attention to the city. Um, but of course, it can also displace the elderly, it can displace minorities. 
So you have to have an honest conversation to have people who can see it from both sides if you want to have a more open conversation about gentrification. Um, you can also try to invite people who know more about it if you want to have um, a conversation about how it happens, how you can change policies about it. Um, what was the second half of the question? Uh, this, sorry. Uh, affordable housing and supporting low-income families in general through kind of national politics? Um, that's a tough one just because Detroit is so vast and so many people struggle with different incomes in Detroit alone. So I don't know what it could be done to exactly fix or create um, low-income low affordable housing just because you have to have someone who's willing to stand up for it and willing to have somebody who will support it. So I don't know exactly what you can do to fix it. Okay, so our next question is, can you speak more on the historical landmarks and the community narratives that are changing? So aside from displacement, it seems that distinct community history is getting washed away and vulnerable populations also would include undocumented immigrants who face unique challenges when relocating as they rely heavily on social networks to find stable housing. Next part was meant for you. Yeah. <laughs> I, okay, I'll go with the land part. <laughs> <laughs> the other, the other half, I know I can't. Um, so yeah, from a standpoint of, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, pieces, or uh, puzzle pieces that need to be researched out uh, and and documented from a historical uh, standpoint. There are a lot of uh, gaps in documenting the history of some of the things that happened in Detroit. Uh, in looking at the civil rights sites uh, project that I'm, I'm working on, uh, the, the first meeting, the first question that came up is, can, can we just, can we put documentation or can we commemorate buildings that are already been uh, demo because a lot of that has happened. Uh -huh. So it's like, no, we can't do that. That's not part of the grant that we have to help uh, get this project going. It has to be a structure that's still there. So if you think about the lost history that's already gone through urban, urban renewal and demolition, that's, that's if it's not already commemorated, it's not going to be brought back. So still that needs to be documented uh, and researched. And then, uh, and then how do you preserve the history that is there, um, it's basically through, it's through connections and through networks that you have to uh, have meetings and outreach and, and then you'll run into that person who knows their aunt or uncle who was part of this movement or part of this meeting and, and, and it's all through connections, it's all through conversations that, that those bits of pieces of history are gonna come out to even know what uh, nuggets to go research because it's like, uh, all of that comes from the conversation, especially with, with the elderly um, that are that are still here and uh, in the city. So, uh, some way of continue to bridge those gaps, not this place that people like a gentleman in the movie has been here for a number of years. You need to keep that person here. He could tell you a story about something that is right around the corner that you have no clue about uh, that actually connects back to almost a ripple effect of other things. So. Very, very complex, and I, I can't even begin to uh, <laughs> answer the second part of <laughs> So um, I'm going to give our last set of questions, um, and then we'll close up the Q&A and, and prepare to close out. Um, but these last three questions all relate to what's specific about gentrification in Detroit and what is universal or more generalizable. So what can we learn from other places? So the first person asked, how do you explain the huge disparity in property values, so $400,000 versus $4,000, both occurring within four or five miles, that this seems unique and specific to Detroit and perhaps not generalizable to other parts of our country? Another um, person asked a similar question around how much how, how much did the impact of the forced bankruptcy in Detroit have on neighborhoods outside of Midtown and downtown? And if that is something that creates a specific kind of neighborhood change or gentrification in Detroit. 
and then the third question looks at it from a, a slightly different angle, which says, what are some successful strategies that other cities have used to fight gentrification? And are there reasons why um, those things can be applied uh, to Detroit and vice versa? So um, I will let two of the panelists who feel very strongly comment on this series of questions around what do we learn, what's unique to Detroit, and what's generalizable. I was going to ask you, Keisha, to give <laughs> to talk about the example we were talking about earlier um, when we were talking about uh, um, Penn University uh, coming into a neighborhood and actually investing in that neighborhood. And, um, I thought that was a great example of what could happen here in Detroit uh, with schools, because we uh, that's a whole another subject we have kind of like skated around and and nobody knows all the answers to. But to me, that was a great example of, uh, of something Detroit could ask when doing incentives, ask uh, you know for a private public partnership between whatever larger entity is coming in and getting that tax incentive to do something like that. Okay, so I'll give a one minute summary and then allow some of the other panelists to comment. Um, so for those of you who may be familiar with uh, gentrification in Philadelphia, University City, which is a community that is out, um, uh, University of Pennsylvania and Drexel um, University both occupy this space. There are a couple of other smaller schools that are there, um, but University of Pennsylvania actually built a local public school um, in the community. It's Sadie T. Alexander, and it was built to commemorate the first African-American woman who graduated with a PhD from Penn. And that school is um, sponsored by the university. They provide tremendous resources, and it's a very excellent elementary school. And it's been so desirable that people have actually um, started moving into the neighborhood just to have such a high quality educational experience um, for their uh, children at a time when public schools, particularly in Philadelphia, are really losing resources. That is, remains one of the highest resource schools. Um, and so it is an example of a university or an institution making a commitment to building the public infrastructure and it's also had the impact of increasing the housing value, and so it's also led to some displacement in those communities. So that's kind of our Philadelphia example of people asking for resources and also what's come out of that. And I'd love to hear any of the other panelists share. Um, so I'm not an economist, but I will play one on this panel for a second. Um, you know, I think the question about what's specific about gentrification in Detroit and what's universal, I think the market forces, this this duality of the $400,000 house and the $4,000 house, um, and, and the role that the market is playing in, um, you know, making particular areas desirable, and when they're desirable, the prices go up. I think that's universal to gentrification. I think Detroit is um, at the sort of far extreme of that because you have so much space, as some of the other panelists have talked about, you have so much vacancy and foreclosed housing um, and so much dilapidated housing where you know, there, there's almost no middle ground to the Detroit housing market, um, which is pretty crazy, uh, which also makes getting mortgages for sort of the average person almost impossible. Um, and so there's a real gap, and I think that that's part of what makes Detroit very different and maybe will be part of why you might not see sort of spillover effects of gentrification in the same way that you might in other cities. Um, in terms of the bankruptcy, I think um, you know, it certainly affected city services and city workers. Um, I, I don't know specifically how to talk about how it contributed to gentrification. Um, other than to say, you know, one of the main sort of bargaining chips that came in and out was the Detroit Institute of Art, which happens to be in Midtown, which is where, sort of, if you want to talk about neighborhoods in Detroit gentrifying, it's one of those uh, epicenters of that. Um, and so thinking about how that was used as a bargaining chip or ultimately not used as a bargaining chip might have some interesting implications. Um, and then the last piece about successful strategies to fight gentrification. I was thinking about this um, 
when Dr. Perry was talking about the importance of churches and um, when Sandra was talking about them as well, um, that in DC there is um, uh, the Shaw Howard U Street corridor, um, which was one of the two neighborhoods, H Street being the other one, that was decimated by riots um, and that has really seen an incredible resurgence um, and you know, it possible, I think most people would say that those are gentrifying neighborhoods. One of the things that's interesting about the Shaw neighborhood is that there's a lot of church-owned affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And so as, um, you know, uh, for-profit uh, apartment building owners have said, mm, I'm not going to accept Section 8 anymore, um, and those have become market rate, places that are housing, affordable housing that's owned by institutions like churches have been able to stand their ground and say this is affordable first and foremost and it will never be anything but that. And so you've actually seen um, you know, relatively little displacement in that neighborhood in comparison to some other cities. And so I think that that is an interesting strategy for how um, some lower income communities and institutions working in those communities can help stand their ground. Because um, I think we often talk about integrated communities as being the ideal, but and, and that can be racially integrated or economically integrated or all of the above. Um, but we don't have very much evidence that those places actually exist and that they exist for a long period of time. And I talked about the you know, ebbs and flows of neighborhoods, um, and so I think there's a question of how long do, should we expect anything to stay static, but you know, what are the institutions that can help maintain that level of integration? Um, you know, I think that's sort of something to look for, and some of those uh, church institutions are, are able to do that. I just have a few comments. Okay. Um, so I think, um, I think what's interesting about the DIA and, and when they were sorting out the bankruptcy is that it actually became a regional solution, right? The three counties voted to support it. And so a lot of people thinking about the transit thing, if, if it was seen more, and it's been on the ballot, et cetera, a regional solution to transit would help because a lot falls on Wayne County. Second of all, I think Detroit is, I don't know, unique, but certainly faces a challenge of absentee landlordism where people don't even know who owns these places, and that's a then you know people don't even know who to go to to maintain it, et cetera. Um, um, so that's something to think about. And I guess um, our group has really looked at policy um, strategies that are used in other other places. And like DC has something, and other places have the first right of refusal. So um, tenants have the first right to buy a unit, but if tenants are low income and perhaps buying is not an option, the whole building, if I, I don't know exactly how the process works, they could sign it over to a church or a nonprofit. And that, I think, is the mechanism, the legislative mechanism to then get it uh, to a way that it could be uh, held as, a, as affordable housing. So first right of refusal, I think housing trust funds are what other cities have come up with creative ways, and then people have to be creative about how to keep them funded. Um, and then I think we should have talked a little bit more about community benefits agreements as a way that communities can sort of, um, it, it was certainly also on the ballot, but also uh, in Detroit last year, but also sort of a way to claim sort of if, if new businesses are coming in, what does the community expect? What are the gr agreements uh, by which we will operate? So it's something certainly a lot of people in Detroit are talking about community benefits. So I'm going to pause, not in the conversation, because I know you have more questions. Um, those of you who are here can stay and talk with our panelists, but I'm going to turn it back over. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you all very much. Yeah, I don't. I'm not sure I want to stop it here too, or just put in my own two cents. Um, but I, but I really do appreciate the the discussion at the end, particularly about the the large number of policies that we know we or we can at least try that will allow us to try to create stable, sustainable, diverse communities. We know that there are lots of policies at this local, state, and federal level that have actually undermined communities. And so I don't think we should feel like this is something we can't do anything about. We had there are different examples of community organizations in Detroit today and across the country, um, as well 
well as policymakers who are trying things. And I, and I think this is a great opportunity to try to bring attention to those and to, uh, and to, and to compare those opportunities and to bring the attention both to scholars and to community organizations to protect and preserve um, and strengthen the, the communities in which we live. Um, but that's not what I'm really here to say. What I'm really here to say is thank you all to our panelists. This was really wonderful. Um, Um, thanks to Dr. Moore, to Professor Moore for leading the discussion. This was great. Thanks to all of you for coming and for your great questions. I want to remind you that we are going to be showing um, Class Divide again ne um, next week at the Michigan Theater. We are also going to be having a discussion. Whoops. Um, the author of How to Kill a City will be there. Um, we're also, for those of you who are at um, the Institute for Social Research, ISR Reads is reading How to Kill a City um, uh, now, and that we, they will be um, discussing the book where I have the date. Um, um, on Friday, March 23rd, um, ISR Reads will be discussing um, this book at the book club discussion, and then and then. Um, the author, Peter Moskowitz, will be, um, will be uh, speaking at 1 o'clock. So that's Friday, March 23rd, in this room at 1 o'clock. Um, and this is open to the entire campus community. We'll have a discussion with the author, Peter Moskowitz. So, um, so please put those on your calendar as well. You can find more the information about all of these events if you go to the University of Michigan MLK Symposium website. There is even an app if you want to download that, or you can look at the, you know, print out the PDF, um, depending on your preferences. Um, but please um, take a look there because um, we both have our um, uh, the ISR's next um, next event, but there are um, probably hundreds, certainly dozens, of events going on at the university over the next few weeks um, to to honor um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and to continue his um, his legacy and his work. And we appreciate and look forward to working with all of you in doing that. Thank you, and please feel free to come to conversation. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.